Well, I'm, I'm very grateful to Giovanni. I thought I was the only one who had noticed that the IMF was in the in Tom Cruise's movies, you know. <laughs> it's called Impossible Mission Force. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I never dared to I never dared to mention it, but uh, I think it was uh, was very important. So. I, I'm going to talk about, uh, about the helicopter. The helicopter is a very fashionable machine right now in, in economics, um, especially uh, in some parts of Europe, and, but also uh, if you read some market analysis in the, in the, in, in the US as well. And uh, I found that coalition, and I think it's, uh, it's actually a very good summary of the kind of policy dilemmas we are facing now in terms of deleveraging and uncertainty, you know? So uh, we are trying to pull on many levers, and uh, sometimes we may contradict ourselves, so we may crash the helicopter, and uh, there is no such thing as a gliding helicopter. And nevertheless, we are trying to sort of soft land the economy somewhere, and uh, I'm just going to present some kind of very personal reflections to how it could be or it could not be done. Uh, articulating monetary policy and prudential policy. I think that the main message I have here is that um, we are used to think in terms of policy mix between the fiscal policy and the monetary policy. And we have prudential policies which are kind of separate. And whose consequences for the global equilibrium of the economy are very seldom assessed. And I think there's a lot to be, to be, to be won by looking together at the policy mix between monetary policy and prudential policy and trying to bring more consistency between those two branches of, 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 our, of our public actions. So basically, I mean, this is, a, this is quite basic. We are in a situation where we have this kind of very sort of negative feedback loop between uh, deleveraging and uncertainty. It's pretty clear why uncertainty uh, triggers deleveraging. Why would you want to leverage if you cannot assess your risk return profile? So uncertainty is an inhibition to leverage. And I want to elaborate a little bit more why deleveraging itself brings uncertainty. So this is very informal. This is not formalized. This is not modelized. I have to apologize for it. I don't have the capacity to do this. And I haven't found it anywhere, actually, in terms of the literature. So there are several things which, which may be worth mentioning. The first one is that uh, deleveraging by one agent creates externality on others. Uh, typically, when the banks deleverage, the corporates are not, uh, there are no incentives, for instance, for the corporates to leverage. So there, there, there is a coordination problem there, and a very important coordination problem. If one agent ex uh, uh, expects the others to, to deleverage, there is an incentive to deleverage as well. And liquidity creation actually helps this coordination problem. Now, a couple of weeks ago, one of my students came to me with a story which is circulating on the web. You may have seen that one. So it's a German tourist who check in into an Irish hotel. And by checking in, uh, he or she uh, forgets a 100 euro note on the, on the desk and goes to his room. As soon as the, the, the person has got to her room, the hotel keeper takes the 100 bill, rushes to his grocer. He has a debt to his grocer of 100 euros. He pays that some debt. The grocer has a debt to a transporter. <laughs> It, uh, to a tourist operator, he goes to pay the debt. The tourist operator has a debt to the hotel. He goes back to the hotel. And one, uh, once the, uh, one, the, uh, one, the, um, the German tourist wakes up in the morning, he finds 100 euro bills on the, on the desk, and nevertheless, all the debt has disappeared. <laughs> so this is, typically, this is typically a case where liquidity can help and solve a coordination problem. And everybody has the leverage with no, with, 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 no, with no harm and no pain. So that, that, that's quite important. And actually, that is, in my view, a very good justification of the kind of liquidity policy we have now <laughs> in period of deleveraging. And this is an answer to Mitch's question yesterday. Uh, a bad bank would do the same. A bad bank would, would take all the assets of WS quality and organize the deleveraging and the taking of losses. That's a global bad bank or a euro bad bank. It would eliminate a lot of those coordination problems. So I think we should, we should consider that. The second reason why uh, the leverage increase uncertainty is, of course, is that nobody knows the end point. <coughs> we have no reference to judge what is the good level, level of leverage in the economy. If you read market analysis today, 
uh, you see that uh, a lot of people would say a debt level as percentage of GDP has hardly moved in any country. Uh, the debt has been redistributed from the private sector to the public sector, but the overall debt as a percentage of GDP has hardly moved. With the uh, implication that there's a lot more to come, we don't know why. I mean, it's hardly, it's, it's clear that debt to GDP is at high historical level. Where should it go down? We don't know. Where should debt to GDP, public debt to GDP go down? We don't know. So we don't know the end point. And that's, of course, a, a major creation of uncertainty. And I think that quotation by Egerson uh, Woodward is, is, uh, is a very good one. We don't have a reference. And uh, it's, it's, it's basically a, a kind of assessment of our part. So as a consequence, of course, no one knows how, how long the process will last. And of course, this is basically the definition of uncertainty. And it's very difficult to define an optimal path of the leveraging for our economies. So basically, we can have two opposite, very strict strategies. The first one, which is we do it abruptly. We take our losses. We deleverage massively. And of course, we have a major macro shock. And we don't know how we can recover from it and whether we, we will not lose in terms of GDP what we were trying to win or to regain in terms of that. Mm. And the second one is to delay as much as possible. And we have, of course, the sort of counter example of what the Japanese did, and which, which, which caused them an enormous amount of term of uh, misallocation of resources and, 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 and efficiency. So the path is certainly, the optimal path is certainly between those two extremes. We have no idea where it is between those two extremes. And that creates also an additional source of uncertainty. So someone come out with, I mean, many people are coming out today with the idea that one way of sort of reducing that overall level of uncertainty is to do a kind of more aggressive monetary policy uh, in terms of helicopter drop, which is basically uh, the government, uh, the, the central bank buying unlimited amounts of government debt with the explicit objective of financing government expenditure. Now, the rationale, of course, is triple. The first one is that you finance the only economic agent which is today willing to leverage and uh, which can decide to leverage independently of market condition. The second rationale is that you could avoid, I think it's a wrong one, but I, I have to explain it. You could avoid Ricardian equivalence because you're not incurring additional public debt. And the first rationale, of course, is there is no inflation threat today because broad money is stable and the money multiplier has collapsed. And for those archaic people to whom I belong who still think inflation is a monetary phenomenon, that is kind of reassuring thing. Now, what's wrong with, with this reasoning? There is one missing element of this reasoning. It's very simple. You can see it through looking at the balance sheet. Is that bank reserves which are issued uh, by, by the central bank in an operation like this is in effect government debt. It is government debt of a special form. It is a claim. If you, if you consolidate what happens in the government, uh, balance sheet and what happened on central bank balance sheet, uh, then the reserves are a claim on future primary surpluses of the government. It's a claim of a specific kind. It's, a, it's apparently very liquid, but there is no way escaping that it is additional debt. And in an intercorporal concern, the, there will be a moment where agents will consider it as an additional debt. At least that's, that, that, that's what I think. So the question we have to ask ourselves about the ultimate effect of such monetary policies is not so much about the immediate inflation impact or, or whatever, but what is going to be the future evolution of demand for reserves and what happens when the demand for reserves is not infinite as it is now. <coughs> uh, again, many questions, no answer. At the moment, there is absolutely no problem because there is a safety premium of holding bank reserves. And of course, uh, there's also perfect substituability between short-term debt and bank reserves because no one, none, none of those instruments is, uh, is carrying interest. So this is not an issue right now. Uh, let's suppose it's become an issue and that the demand for bank reserves uh, diminishes for some reason. Banks don't want to hold reserves. Now, the interesting thing which I think very few people realize, <laughs> you cannot run away from bank reserves. <laughs> There are, there are liabilities at the, on, on the central bank balance sheet, and uh, there is no way to go, especially if you are in the floating exchange rate regime. Uh, then, of course, uh, I mean, uh, the amount of central bank reserve is absolutely discretionarily determined by the central bank, and, if, uh, and there is no, you can reallocate them between banks, but you cannot run away globally from them. So what you can do is, of course, you can buy government debt, so that reduces bank reserves and uh, 
uh, increase government liquidity, or you can uh, you, you can go you can run away uh, from the currency itself, and you can ask the central bank to exchange bank reserve against foreign exchange reserve. That's the only two ways you can sort of run away from a, from a, from a foreign exchange reserve. And that would trigger, of course, a big kind of portfolio reallocation, price movement, exchange rate movement, interest rate movement. We have no idea. We have no idea what would be the overall impact on this, what would be the impact on the slope of the yield curve, what would be the impact on the exchange rate, and what would be the ultimate impact on the, uh, on the, um, on the, um, on the economy. Uh, what we can see now in terms of volume is that uh, the situation is very different between countries. Uh, in the U.S., basically, the share of uh, public debt which has been held by the central bank has not changed very much over the last uh, five or six or seven years, contrary to what people think. It's still oscillating between 13 and 16 or 17 percent. Now, in other countries, like the U.K., for instance, the share has jumped from zero to 20 or 30 percent. I'm talking about the outstanding stock of debt. So, just intu very intuitively, and I'm sorry I cannot be more precise than this, uh, the price effect of a change in the demand for different sort of government debt might be very different uh, according to very different, uh, uh, according to different central banks. And then, of course, at one moment, and this is specifically part of the exit strategy of the Fed, for instance, interest rates on reserves can increase. Uh, and then you get into the kind of very unpleasant monetary arithmetic that you, can, you, you are accounting for fiscal expenditure that you have been not accounting for be before. And uh, actually, what, what I would analyze uh, the uh, kind of helicopter drop of money is just moving fiscal expenditure across different periods of time. You are taking implicit fiscal expenditure now, you're just not uh, you're just not accounting for that. And it might be tempting at this stage to use reserve requirement and to move away, if things become very, very difficult, to move away from the practice, which is quite recent actually, of remunerating reserves. And one stabilization instrument, which might prove very useful if things turn very badly in a very bad scenario, is non-remunerative reserve requirement, kind of instrument of financial repression, tax on banks. Uh, very old-fashioned right now, be may become more fashionable if a disaster scenario uh, uh, would, uh, would materialize. So I, wouldn't rule, I, would, I would not rule reserve requirement as a major instrument in monetary policy. It is a major instrument in emerging economies. It could become another major instrument in, uh, in, in developed economies in a bad scenario. And then, of course, there is a big question of uh, uh, inflation expectations, which are extremely stable now. There is absolutely no reason to think of any kind of inflationary scares or whatever. Uh, the relationship, I think, what a lot of people in the markets have, more or less rationally, uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe less than more, but it's still there, whether the kind of PRC fiscal dominance that the helicopter drop of money would create would or not trigger inflation expectations. <coughs> Now, I'm coming to my main point, is that we have, I think, the wrong policy mix right now. So we have a very accumulative monetary policy, which I think is quite appropriate. We have very restrictive prudential policies, especially in the banking system. So we have a, and I'm going to elaborate on that, we have a prudential regime, a capital requirement regime, which is pushing the banks to deleverage uh, aggressively over the last years. And that prudential policy is formulated in a way which fuel uncertainties. So it seemed a good idea, for instance, at the start. So we are going to set very tight standards for uh, bank capital requirement, and we are <coughs> going to let them, to leave them with some delay to uh, fulfill those standards until like 2017. Now, it seems a good idea. But what happened, of course, is that the market started immediately to sort of uh, anticipate, expect, and ask for this kind of adjustment. So basically, we've opened a kind of very big period of uncertainty between now and 2017 as to what kind of behavior the banks are supposed to have. And that does not, does not, that, that is no good for credit distribution. So uh, with, with hindsight, this kind of very smart move, we tighten, the, we tighten the, the capital requirement, but we give a delay, is in my view now proving uh, very, very detrimental to, to credit dynamics and to growth. 
Uh, and we have distortion in portfolio choices and asset prices. Obviously, I think it's, it's, very, it's very commonplace. We have a huge interest risks piling up in balance sheet, balance sheet of banks, balance sheet of insurance companies, balance sheet of pension funds, who are buying enormous amounts of treasuries or other kind of uh, uh, substitutable securities at very high, very low interest rates. And that creates the risk of what uh, a higher BIS official has called financial dominance, that central banks could be refrained from raising interest rates because that would create enormous problems in terms of financial stability. So uh, I think that kind of policy mix we have now is part of the reason why we have so much uncertainty about the deleveraging process. And my own, my own personal view is that we should pay much more attention in the way of our monetary policy and financial policy are articulated with one another and not having one pushing direction and the other pushing in the other direction. So very, very modest proposal to end up this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this presentation. I think we should, uh, I'm going to put it kind of very sort of a little bit uh, pretentious way, we should have marginal capital requirements which are lower than the average capital requirement. This is a way of saying that future credit should have lower capital requirement than existing loans. And I think we, we, will have the best of, we, we will have the best of both worlds by doing that. We would still build robust capital base for those assets of uncertain quality that are still in the banking system and make sure that they have lots of absorption mm -hmm. capacity. And we would not create this incentive to take risk in the future. Now, it looks like, uh, it looks like a very strange idea. Uh, actually, <coughs> we are going to that direction. We should do it more explicitly. Uh, we are prepared to modulate capital requirement according periods of time. So this is a very fashionable idea of having counter-cyclical capital requirement. We are prepared to modulate capital requirement according to different quality of assets. So it's only one more step <laughs> to modulate capital requirement. <laughs> both according to time and quality and, and nature of assets. And that's exactly what I'm proposing. We are moving that direction. The funding for lending scheme, for instance, of the Bank of England is clearly a, a move in that direction. So they provide, they provide privileged funding uh, for, for the banks at, at, a, at, at a very attractive interest rate. And in addition to that, something which has been very little noticed, that comes with lower capital requirements than the average. And most recently, the FSA, two or three days ago, said we are going to, for new banks which could be created, we are going to ask them for low, much lower capital requirement than banks existing bank. So this idea of having marginal capital requirement much lower than the, the, the average one, I think is, is making progress. And I think it would be a very good thing. I'm, it won't solve uh, the, whole, the whole issue, but it would eliminate the big uncertainty which is created by bank deleveraging in economies like, like the European economies, where a lot of the financing depends on the bank. And finally, I mean, we've been talking about macroprudential policy for, for years now. We have a huge macroprudential risk piling up in balance sheet, and we do nothing about it. And it would be very easy, very easy, uh, at least technically, <laughs> to find a way to account and uh, to account for interest risk piling up in the balance sheet of banks either in the form of special reserve requirement or in the form of special provision, which could be counted against future capital needs. Uh, that would not deter banks from taking this kind of risk, but that would make sure that they are able to face them if and when they materialize in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>